and Brian Kroger. Hey everyone, I'm Brian Kroger and today I'm going to be talking to you about scaling leadership. Ten years ago, I joined the Air Force as an officer and for ten years I used pretty awful software. Finally, I'd had enough and I transferred from operations to defense acquisitions where I founded an Air Force program called Kessel Run. And yeah, we traded out our uniforms for hoodies and Agile Air Force hashtags, but it was so much more than that. I quickly learned that the kind of leadership I had become accustomed to didn't align well with software development at all. Kessel Run changed DoD software acquisitions forever, but it wasn't about technology or process as much as it was about a fundamentally different approach to people and to leadership. I'm taking the approach I learned and honed there with me as I launch my own company, Rise8, where I'll continue helping the government to transform how it builds software. As many of you are aware, that comes with many challenges like scaling leadership. I believe it really boils down to problematic narratives. Every so often an article like this one would come out about Kessel Run. Cloud enables combat coders. Just buy a little cloud, maybe a cloud platform, sprinkle it with some agile DevOps, and bam, you've got yourself a digital transformation. That's not how any of this works. Culture enables combat coders, not cloud computing. You could do this before the cloud. And if you couldn't do it without the latest tech and processes, then you can't do it with them either, unless you're willing to fundamentally change certain aspects of your organization. It's not magic, but that narrative is pervasive. As Nietzsche pointed out, we tend to look at how things are and assume they came to be by magic. He goes on to say that our vanity is the culprit. We tend to explain away great achievement with magic so that we don't have to hold ourselves accountable for not reaching similar achievements. So think about that from the perspective of the status quo. Admitting that this is really just thousands of hours of effort on the right things is problematic for two reasons. One, it means the status quo could have done this all along and doesn't let them off the hook. And two, it means the status quo, who haven't put in thousands of hours of deliberate practice, can't reasonably take credit for the achievement and aren't qualified to lead it. So the magic myth continues to be perpetuated. The unfortunate side effect is that leaders in the organization, senior leaders who are a little bit removed from this, they see all the goodness coming from the initial delivery teams and they genuinely want to help. But they turn to the status quo who believe this is just some new magic and they'll attempt to scale it by parachuting in the old organization's brightest leaders. That is not a very successful way to scale digital transformation. And us innovators don't do ourselves any favors here. We just work so damn hard that everyone naturally assumes aliens did it. In all seriousness though, we don't talk enough about the mundane aspects of what we do. So I'm asking everyone to counter the narrative. Tell the real story. It is a ton of hard work. I love Angela Duckworth's take on this from her book Grit. Achievement is the product of effort and skill, and skill is the product of talent and effort. Effort goes into the equation twice. How do you scale that? Unfortunately, there is no escaping the mundanity of scaling in the real, non-magical world. Scale is the aggregate of thousands of hours of deliberate practice, carefully synthesized by visionary leaders into a complex whole. Stated a different way, it's hard work by gritty people. And it's their growth rate that determines the growth rate of the organization. But there's a ceiling on that growth rate. As Bob Anderson said, the organization cannot perform at a higher level than the consciousness of the leadership. So it's important to remember that the experienced employee that the status quo wants to parachute in has zero hours of deliberate digital practice, while that inexperienced employee now has thousands of hours. So choose wisely. You need digital leaders. You probably don't have those, so you need to grow them. They're the ones that are gonna set the tone for the culture and implement the structure that you need to scale. And yeah, I said it, culture. One parachuted leader told me, Brian, you got to stop talking about culture. That's just fluff for the Harvard Business Review. And that's why I love this quote from Safi. The word certainly has been abused, but it still means something. What I also love, though, is that Safi highlights that from a leadership perspective, structure is equally important, particularly as it relates to structural incentives. Sometimes those are a recipe for disaster, though, in the government space. It's analogous to the financial sector, where Warren Buffett observed 
that first come the innovators, then come the imitators, and then come the idiots whose avarice undoes the innovations they're trying to use to get rich. And for our purposes in government, you can swap that out with any number of bad incentives. Successful innovation efforts are the shiny objects that attract the so-called high-performing officers like magnets, and we don't guard against it, culturally or structurally. Eventually, though, they run out of other people's successes, and I've seen several innovation transformations die now as leaders aren't equipped to lead a digital transformation. It looks a lot like this. And let me go with the best case here. The best case is that the person under that blindfold may be a really great government leader, but he or she doesn't have the digital leadership competency that they need. At best, the innovators, they get a servant leader that empowers the people, and that's something we've all wanted from our leaders for all of our careers. But in this case, it's not enough. Digital transformation is a pioneer's job. It requires vision and strategy to match practitioner execution. And at worst, if you've been around government for any length of time, you know how that goes. The thing I hate, though, is again the narrative. When things were going well, we started with the narrative that this is magic. When these blind leaders step in and things start going poorly, the narrative becomes our people are too stupid and this doesn't scale. Could we all just agree that there's no talent shortage in the federal government? Just a shortage of environments where employees with a growth mindset can learn and thrive. And digital transformation does scale, but you have to scale digital leadership first. It's not magic, it's hard work. I'm asking each of you to fight these three narratives. They aren't as innocent as they seem. They are in fact extremely damaging. And as we think about an alternative narrative, think about this anecdote from Adrian Cockroft about a CIO summit where a fortune something company CIO gets up and says that they don't have Netflix superstar engineers so they can't do the Netflix things. And Adrian looks around the room at all of the companies and he says, we hired them from you all and then we got out of their way. Now, of course, there's a lot to unpack in the phrase, get out of the way. It's really not quite so simple. You see, that's really about leadership, setting up the right culture and structure so that you can give teams autonomy and still have the organization pointed at the outcomes that we're trying to achieve. Now, I'm not gonna talk in depth about these two concepts today, but every digital leader in government should be well-versed in the ideas presented in these two books. Now, Lean Startup is very popular in the government innovation circles right now, but if you haven't read the Lean Enterprise from the Lean series, I highly recommend it. I find it a bit more broadly applicable to our environment. Loon Shots, on the other hand, has a great way of depicting the impact of structure on the success or failure of crazy ideas. Now, so far I've been pretty high level, so before I close, I'd like to get a bit more tactical with one anti-pattern to avoid and one pattern that you should consider. First, don't build an org chart this way. My son Declan has modeled what I often see, which is building out the entire safe framework before the first team has even started to work. The team ends up crushed under the weight of a new bureaucracy. You can even forget about the old one. It's an alignment trap. And Declan helps me demonstrate here that it's fragile and it fails, and that the person that did it won't take responsibility and the narratives persist. Instead, Add roles and alignment mechanisms just in time, allowing them to evolve with the architecture based on the problem you're trying to solve. This is a proposal I recently put together at Rise 8 to scale to a government-led 30 product lab team with over 250 people in just two years. I'll be putting out a video on it very soon and I'd love to help anyone that wants to use it to transform their government program. It accounts for many of the things that I got wrong at Kessel Run, like not deliberately growing leaders as they emerge from day one. In this example, an eventual software leader starts as a member of the first product teams. As a leader emerges, a new backfill is brought in to pair. The lead is then promoted to a portfolio leader as the first portfolio emerges, perhaps around quarter three. And in the next quarter gains three practice leads to manage the growing practices. And in quarter five, perhaps becomes the lead of what the Air Force is looking for, right? A software leader, the answer to the material leader in the software space. What's really important though, is that this software leader has learned by doing, not learned in a classroom. And importantly, you also notice that three balanced portfolio leadership teams also emerge to serve a growing lab of product teams. And this is really important. And this pattern continues always just in time based on conditions to support the product team needs. 
not the organization's wants and needs. We're not imposing things on the product teams. We want to serve the product teams. Now, this model is really condition based, like I said, and this perfect state is full of assumptions, but it's a great starting point. Also important, you'll notice that there are co-teams and government teams. I believe that the focus should be on enabling the government to own this long term. At Rise8, we care about purpose over profits. And we prefer a model where we sit down side by side with the government and have them learn by doing with us. And for us, that means working on real problems, building real software for real users, and putting that in real production environments that they can use to conduct real operations. That's a whole lot of realness, but that's really important. And once we do that, then we get out. And that proposed mitosis model is a great way to scale change in a viral sort of way. And finally, this is only one of three parts necessary for what I believe represents success in government digital transformation. You're also gonna need platform and agile acquisitions, and the software leader needs to be well-versed in all three. Again, look out for a video soon that describes this model in better detail. But to sum up, this isn't magic, and the status quo can't lead it. We need to grow digital leaders, so please, please, tell the real story. There is no talent shortage, and digital transformation can scale, but it takes digital leadership. Scale is really just the aggregate of thousands of hours of deliberate practice. It's really mundane. And digital leaders, they need practice too. Incorporate learning by doing into your acquisition strategy. And even if you don't choose the model that I described, make sure you include learning and skill growth in your contract strategies or if you're on the other side of the equation in your proposals and not as an add-on. Make sure that includes leadership enablement that's in sync with the program's evolution. I believe that if you focus on that transformation, the human transformation, that the technology and process will naturally follow. Thank you everyone. I hope you liked this video. If you did, please like it, share it, subscribe to my channel. There'll be more coming soon.